Welcome to the Beverly Hills Plastic Surgery Podcast. This is Dr. Jay Calvert, and I am here today with not only my most amazing and excellent co-host, Dr. Millicent Ravello. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing great. But you are also the subject of this podcast. <laughs> I know. I'm the patient. <laughs> wow. It's very different. It is very different. So special podcast, we are going to be talking about a surgery that I recently had. You were my surgeon. I was the patient. And we just want to talk about the experience. And, and not an easy patient, by the way. No, just... <laughs> <laughs> I think we established I was the worst patient. So, so <laughs> doctors as patients could be a whole... Like, it could be a podcast of its own. For sure. I mean, doctors as patients, typically, they know better. They, they want to do it their way. And they typically have problems because of their intense knowledge of the subject matter of what they're going through. Well, I don't think I did that. I no, just you were great. think that I... Well, we can talk about my recovery. I just didn't know when to stop doing things, even though I know better. But we'll, we'll get to that. So let's just For walk sure. through, you know, sort of what we did here. So, so so the operation that we did and what, so first of all, what caused you to say like, hey, I got to talk to my pal Jay about doing something. So my concern as I was aging and getting older was that I noticed that my under eyes and the junction between the lower lid and the cheek was becoming very pronounced. There was a groove there, which I constantly had to put under eye concealer on to conceal it. So that was my initial concern, was that lower lid junction there. And then my other concern was my eyebrows. They were starting to descend and sit lower, and it was giving my eyes more of a closed, pinched off look. And if I did too much Botox, I would really notice it because my eyebrows would drop even more. So those are my two main concerns. We're sort of that whole upper eye, upper face area. So you think Botox was hitting its limits? It was. But the problem was the Botox was wearing off faster and faster because I actually needed to use my forehead muscles to lift my eyebrows. It was a functional thing. And then when I would freeze those muscles with the Botox, then they couldn't do their actual job, which was to lift my eyebrows, and they would sink even lower. So there you have it. It's, uh, it was all about lower lids and the brow positioning. Right. And so the optimal operation for that is really a brow lift and a mid face lift combined with the lower lid blepharoplasty. Correct. And what that is, and that's very fancy terms for lifting of the cheek, which is a mid face lift. We call this mid face because the typical facelift is when we make cuts around the ears and we lift the skin and the and the right. the thick tissue over the muscles. This is really about a cheek lift, a lateral brow or a temporal lift where we're yes. lift, lifting the the tail of the brow and the temporal skin. And then by releasing through going through the lower eyelid and releasing the the junction of the lid, you can blend the the lid right. cheek junction and not need as much concealer. I haven't used any concealer since the procedure, which is so exciting because I'm a, also a bad driver. I will do my makeup when I'm driving on occasion, <laughs> and so I'm looking. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, confessions I'm, of a Beverly Hills I'm plastic, plastic surgeon, surgeon on my way to work, and so in you're not the only one, by the way. Bright daylight, I'm looking in my car, you know, at myself in natural light in my rearview mirror or in my little vanity mirror in the car, and that's when I would really notice the pronounced, not even circles, but just um, volume loss between the lower lid and the cheek. And there's an actual, there's a ligament there. It has a name, the orbital retaining ligament. And so that ligament is what really was pronounced, and I needed to have it released so that you could then lift my cheek up. See, bad pay. I'm telling you your job. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you, you know my job. Um, I thought the interesting thing was uh, when you were thinking about doing this, you came into the OR and watched me do one. I did, Which yes. would have, for me, been like, okay, I'm definitely not doing that. And you were like, okay, I'm, I'm ready. Okay, I'm next. <laughs> Sign me up. My turn. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it does work. I mean, it's a very effective operation. And, you know, the thing that people see with it is... <laughs> Why don't we wait for these sirens to complete? To pass. Yeah on Santa Monica Boulevard. Jeez, it was like unbelievable. Every time. You know what's funny about that too? Like the fact that we're sitting here waiting for sirens to go by. 
Sean will actually leave this portion in the podcast. <laughs> and he'll say something like, yeah, I just thought it was funny that you guys had to wait for sirens. You know, it's like, you know, it's like wait, there's my ride, you know. Um, so I think that the interesting thing about the operation is that not only does it help to uh, smooth that lid cheek junction and get rid of the tear trough deformity, but I think it makes your cheek look better than it ever has looked. I think the, the change of positioning is not something that, it's not like we restored it. It's actually like a more heart-shaped face that really looks good. I mean, I notice on you when you walk in, you look different. Like when you come in, I'm operating, you like poking, hey, what's up? You can see that your face is a different shape than it was before we did this. I don't know if it, it's the shape that you were when you were 22 or 25 or whatever, but it's really nice because you have that really great OG curve, as they call it, where it's kind of, you know, go, it curves out and then curves in, and it's a very good-looking, attractive uh, shape of your face. Right, and that's and that was the goal, and that's what we typically try to accomplish with fillers. So if you go to see someone for fillers because you're worried about, you know, the aging face, one of the first things that they're going to do is suggest that you have fillers on your cheekbones because right. it restores that more pronounced, youthful cheek look. Um, a lot of times people also use under eye fillers to also camouflage that lid chink junction and, and hollowing that you get between the two. Um, as much as I like fillers and I use them on myself, I put them in patients, I don't actually like them that much on myself if I know that there's a surgical solution. Even on my patients, I would rather give them a surgical solution when I know that one is available because fillers, they only camouflage. They don't actually treat what the underlying pathology is. Right, this is a composite. It's moving everything from the skin down to the, the coating over the bones, the periosteum, moving it as a composite and repositioning the whole you know side of your face, which I think really it's just it's it looks really nice for people i've been i've done like six of these in the last three weeks which we have now renamed them the, the millicent the millicent <laughs> like <laughs> oh you're doing the millicent <laughs> and and it is it's that exact combination so um let's talk about you know how the whole process worked um for me you know i, I came the morning of surgery i went to surgery um took what how long i think it was about two and a half hours two and a half hours um, I also, I also had a laser procedure done at the same time while I was asleep. Orla, our fabulous PA came in and blasted my face with a laser because did she do Opus or was it the she did, pixel? Uh, IPL and pixel combination. So the photo pixel. So it, yeah, that's, that's a good one really to do designed under anesthesia, under <laughs> anesthesia because she could really turn up the settings, oh, yeah. which if you're awake, it's a little bit harder to tolerate. And it's doable, but she was really able to go to town with the laser because I was asleep. And so that addresses um, pigment, brown pigment, and also just overall tone and texture of the skin. Right. So I sort of had a big combo procedure done. Right. And then you did recovery at a nearby uh, hotel with yes. uh, one of your pals taking care of you. Yes. So that you were, in case anything should happen, you had somebody with you. Yes. But then you were also close by to the surgery center, which was right. nice. Yeah. And then uh, you went back to work in the next day, which I thought was really inappropriate. <laughs> so. I did. I had to do. It was, it was a really small. It wasn't the next day. It was two days later. Whatever. I had a really small, small, tiny case. I, I just I had to do it. Um, I had a PA helping me. So she was able to do like a lot of the heavy lifting of the case. And I mm -hmm. sort of anyways, <laughs> I know I just, it had to be done. I do not advise doing that. And then this is a do as I say, not, not as, as I, I do. do. <laughs> and I was driving myself. And beautiful. After all of that, you yelled at me and said, stop. You're going to affect the final outcome. You appealed to my vanity, which which was the trick. And I stopped. Yeah. I mean, you were you were going to go full bore. I know I had I know. And I had cases scheduled for the following Monday, which was like five days later. And you told me no. I had to cancel those. So I did. <laughs> no. But it's it's that was the hardest part is I actually felt fine. So from my right. standpoint, what I felt, um, there was some pain that night. I tried taking a pain pill. It didn't work. I was nauseated. So I just took some anti-inflammatories and that was more than enough. I didn't the even, Celebrex is great for that. After that night, I didn't take any pain medicine. Um, what was most um, disturbing was how swollen I was. That I was not expecting. 
Um, but that's because of the laser. The laser. The laser. When you combine the laser with facial aesthetic surgery, pumpkin head. It, oh my that, gosh. It's the best yeah. Halloween costume you can I do. I was a pumpkin. The people that saw me were like, ay, ay. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to come down, right? No, this is what I was shooting for. This is for. what I wanted. You did. You looked like the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man. It was pretty terrible. It was pretty bad. So the things I did for my recovery, um, I went to hyperbarics immediately the next morning, and I did several days worth of hyperbarics. Hyperbarics is a treatment where they put you kind of like an MRI machine. It's this tube structure that they send you in, and you sit there for an hour, you watch some Netflix, and you're breathing in 100% oxygen. And the idea is that really helps in the healing process. It helps with the swelling. It helps with the recovery. Right. It, gets, it does a couple of things. It delivers higher oxygen tension to the wounds. Yes. So they heal faster. But it also brings the swelling down a ton. A like, yeah. Like it takes months, I think, off of your recovery. Yeah. Well, we also did a, a Medrol dose pack, which I think helped too. Yeah. That, that does help a lot too. Yeah. But you were back at work legit like the following Tuesday. Like yeah. It was one, w- seven days after One surgery. week later, I was seeing patients all day in the office and I was operating the next day or the day after that. Yeah. And you were fine at that point. But, yeah. you know, the initial week, you kind of give it some time to kind of like settle, especially I don't want, you know, I don't want it to, to fall down. Like, you know, right. we, you know, we wanted this thing to really, you know, sit where it's at. And uh, you, you need to stick down. But, you know, once the periosteum sticks, that's over. You know, it, it's it's a done deal. So after five, six, seven days, it's it's where it's going to be. Right. But yeah, the hardest part was just staying on my couch for two, three days and not doing anything. Like yeah. I felt like I was wasting time. I'm like, I have all this time. I should be doing something. I should be on my computer. I, but, like, you can't. No. And you can't do <laughs> it I, if you're on can't. drugs, too. You can't. Well, yeah, I know you can't do it on drugs. That's That's not optimal. But... Just I, I tell all my patients that I go, look, yeah. you're going to be home <laughs> and you're going to be on drugs and you're going to think, man, I have all this time. Time to send some emails. No, this is the, this is not the time to send. Emails. It is not just you may lose no. friends. You may, uh, <laughs> you may lose your job. Poorly influence others. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you may, I, we had a, a big actor fire their agent in the recovery room. <laughs> And I was like, what are you doing? I was like, who gave her her cell phone? And I was like, what did you just do? She goes, I fired my agent. I've wanted to do that for so long. I was like, get him back on the phone. You tell him you're in the recovery room. I said, I'm not going to be responsible for that. She was like, I'm drunk dialing. I was like, you are drunk dialing. You cannot do work while you're on drugs. Although maybe she made the right decision. Maybe she wanted to do it for a while and just didn't have the guts and under anesthesia. She was like, she did ultimately fire her. Fired. <laughs> <laughs> that did become permanent because <laughs> she really wanted to do it. And evidently having some no. anesthesia on board kind of got, gave her a little, <laughs> little bit of the, uh, the oomph she needed to get that one over the line. Yes. Agreed. Well, yeah, so that's it. But you were back and doing your stuff and I think you looked really good after about two to three weeks it really settled i I thought you look a little surgical for the first two weeks which is to be expected yeah my eyebrows were sitting a lot higher initially um and obviously the swelling my eyes were bruised the actual eyeballs were red for almost two weeks that took a long time to go away um and i didn't really start feeling comfortable wearing contacts for a good six weeks I, yeah. I wore well, that's glasses the, for a while. Yeah, that's the uh, the, the conjunctival yeah. incisions are, are a little bit swollen on the inside of the eyelid, so you need that to kind of settle. Yeah. But no, overall, I would highly recommend it. You know, the uh, honestly, outside of you, you were the only person in support of this procedure because everyone else, I mean, most of the people that I'm friends with are not in the plastic surgery world. We're like, I don't understand what you're doing. You're getting a facelift. Like you're 38. What is wrong with you? No one really knew what I was doing or why I was doing it. But I knew because I look at my face and I look at the signs of aging and I could see what was happening and I knew what I needed. But those same people after I had the surgery were like, oh, wow. Okay. I see it now. Like you look great. Yes. And they didn't they didn't get it before, but then afterwards they were like, oh, okay. They couldn't pinpoint what was different per se. They just knew it was better. Right. You can't, it, like you look awesome, but you can't be like, oh, this is what's different. Right. I can because I did it right. and I know what happened. And you can because it's your face. But anybody else just sees you as just like, oh my God, you know, did you go away on vacation? Yeah, or like, you, you look amazing. You look more refreshed. And so this is right. this is the age, age group really that benefits. It's that late 30s to early 40s. 
um, age group that doesn't need a facelift. You know, a facelift really addresses the lower face and the jawline. Um, and that's not what this age group needs because what you typically see as the first sign of aging is this upper mid face area. Um, but I feel like a lot of people just don't know about it because it's not really, it's not an operation that's, that the general public knows about. Everyone knows a facelift. They might know a brow lift, but a mid face lift, most people go, huh? What's that? Yeah, it's true. I mean, there are guys that, you know, really push this as their part of their like general facelift. Um, but I, I like to do this for like, like you said, age, you know, I mean, I've done this uh, as early as 28 years old. You know, yeah. if people have if the descent yeah. or they just want to change the shape of their face. It's not because they've necessarily aged. It's that they, they just will look better with yeah. that, you know, fox eye thing right. that everybody's talking about now. And you know, I've been doing this operation since like 1998, basically, is when I kind of got into this. When I saw the guys from Atlanta, actually, Rod Hester and, and uh, the whole group at uh, Paces Plastic Surgery, which I don't even know that they were Paces then, Mark Codner and those guys they were doing this operation and I was like, oh, I really like that. And I started doing it literally at McGee Women's Hospital when I was a resident. And I've, I've kind of gotten it down where now I can really make things move with it. It's, right. it's awesome. I, I love doing this operation. Well, I thank you. Yeah, well, it, it looks good on you. You wear it well. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I it did think it was funny, though, that after you watched me do it, you were like, <laughs> okay, I'm good. Because it's pretty, like, it's a pretty invasive operation from a, like... Oh, yeah. Just, like, to move the cheek is not nothing. Yeah, you know, you really have to... You're taking apart the whole face and then lifting it up. Yeah, I yeah. mean, it's like a real operation. It's yeah. not like, I'm just going to, you know, which... You know, these, I, I don't even want to talk about like the threads and <laughs> like, this is not the threads. This is not a thread lift. No, the thread lift is, it, it, it is going to last, I don't know, six months, a year. I don't even know what the data is, but they probably don't have any because it's probably so disappointing. Right. They, they probably don't even want to like show the data. But the difference is with the thread lift is it's going to cheese wire through the, through the soft tissues right. and whatever you pull up is going to come back down because you haven't moved the underlying structure. Right. This operation moves the underlying structure and you're finished. It's also, you know, it's a little bit more recovery. It's a little bit more, it's obviously more expensive, but right. the, um, you know, we did do the family discount for you, which you know, is <laughs> part of the deal when you're, when you're in the, in the fold, but, yeah. um, but it's still not cheap. It's not cheap, but that's for no. sure. Yeah. It's uh, a real, real operation, a real procedure, you know, no matter who you go to. For sure. I mean, uh, I think, I think it's worth it because the, I've not seen a mid face descend after doing this. Awesome. Yeah, I just haven't, you know, now, you know, Love this part that. down here, you of know, course. we'll get to that at some point, but that's That'll years be like off another five, six years. Yeah. You got five got years or so. You're, you're good on that one. But you, you know, if you jump on these things earlier, then you can continue. The, the whole point is to look great the whole time. Right. Like some people are like, Oh, I'm going to wait till I'm 72 to get that done. I was like, well then just don't do it. Like yeah. you're, you're already, you know, going to be, you know, 15 years too late to your facelift. Right. And you don't want to be that. You don't want to be 15 years le too late to your facelift. Because your you result get is done. just not going to be as good. No, and mm -hmm. you missed all that time that you could have been looking awesome. Having a great face, yeah. Yeah, so it's like, you know, now you look old and then you have a facelift and it's like, well, you look less old. <laughs> <laughs> is that good? I don't know. But you can keep, you can stave off the aging and keep looking great all through your 40s, 50s, 60s, into your 70s if you're doing things along the way. That's the key. Yes. Cool. Anything else you want to talk about your, how about the incisions? They've, they've healed pretty well. Oh yeah. And the, well, the incisions are completely hidden. So I have two incisions in my hairline, you know, off to the side here, one on each side. And then in the inside of my lower lid. Right. Here. So there's no visible so you don't cuts. Even see them. No. Yeah. So w I could come up with some stupid ass marketing campaign like Ooh. like invisible incisions which i can't stand when people do that so i'm not going to do that because <laughs> there are incisions and for those of you that do marketing campaigns like this that are listening to that no offense to your stupid ass marketing campaigns but i mean i don't like when people say like oh scarless this or invisible oh, that i know no, it's not true there are scars anytime you cut skin there's a scar so you do have scars they're just very well hidden you don't see them they're and invisible <laughs> Really? <laughs> Maybe you should do the marketing campaign. I had invisible incisions with my mid face lift. No, I mean, there are scars. I mean, there are cuts. There have been problems with visible scars in the hair 
if the hair doesn't survive there. So I have a very special way that I close them and, and, and have it, uh, you know, heal up. But if the hair doesn't survive along the incision, it's visible. Right. And you have to revise that. And you have to, sometimes I tell people it's better to get hair grafts put in than to try and revise it because the just the scar is too thin or whatever. Yeah. And it's going to be a problem. That's infrequent. Very infrequent. I've seen it from other, I just literally came from a mid-face lift a revision mid face lift and brow lift from a patient who had it done in another city and the scars were awful. Mm. And so I, I had to redo it and I used these terrible incisions to do the mid face lift and brow and hopefully she'll heal it up better. And I think the th the problem was when I got in there, they hadn't released the periosteum. So they were trying to do the brow lift without releasing the periosteum yeah. so it stretched There's the so scars. There's so much tension too. It's yeah, so it's, of course yeah. it's not gonna work. Yeah. So they stretched the scars out and that's why that didn't work. So I released the periosteum obviously and, and so when I closed it, it was a tension-free closure. But um, yeah, I, I feel bad about the stupid ass marketing campaign comment. Is, was that mean? No, and I, I was laughing because I was in the OR the other day and one of the scrub techs was asking me, she's like, doctor, I saw on Instagram this doctor that does scarless mastopexies and augmentations. Oh my God. I was I, like, I can't there's literally it. no way that you can do it. No, no, he says he does it without scars. Okay. If you're putting an incision That's on a patient, you're going to have a scar. Maybe he hides them, like in the areola or something. But that's that's false advertising. She was going to sign up because right, he does she's gonna have a mastopexy surgery. without a scar. <laughs> I like, mean, it's just wrong. Like, that is yeah. not true. It, Scarless rhinoplasty. Like, what is that? You mean you don't have a... You, so it's an endonasal. It's a closed That's rhinoplasty. That's right. There are still scars. Yeah. You can still have problems. They happen to be inside the nose, but those are scars. And those scars come complete with all the problems of other scars. Right. You can get vestibular stenosis. You can get problems with it. You can get, you know, synechia. You can get banding. There's all kinds of problems that happen even though you can't see the scars. It's not scarless. There are scars. I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm going to call it out. I can't stand it. It is such... BS marketing and and it's so designed to like I don't I don't know you, you, I I think you should be transparent with the public and tell them what's so. Which is why we do this podcast. That's right. So there you have it. If you want a scarless brow lift, come to me and I'll <laughs> I'll hide those scars and they won't even, you won't even see them. I mean, come on, I don't, I can't stand that. That's just me. No, but seriously, if you want a mid facelift. This is the guy. He does a great job. I want a mid facelift. Are you going to do mine? I'll do yours. All right, because I need like I need more than a mid. I, I know. need like a total. I wasn't going to say anything. It's awful. It's, <laughs> I need like a total overhaul. I need help badly. I need a neck lift and a facelift. I, I, you know what I should do? I should just should, somebody should put me out to pasture. It's over. It's time. You still got I'm 52 some time. Fifty-two and I've hit. It. I need you to be around to do my facelift. So. Oh, no. All right. So I'll do another. Yeah. I'll do five more years. Thank you. That Appreciate that. Very good. Well, in that case, uh, I appreciate you sharing your story with everybody, Dr. Ravello. It's, uh, I'm sure, an eye-opener for everybody. <laughs> and uh, this is the Beverly Hills Plastic Surgery Podcast coming to you from the 90210.